Coming up tonight, the men's ice hockey team hosts the Ohio State University for a two-game series. Also, women's rugby looks to keep rolling against Westchester. All that and more coming up on Sports Balls right now. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Sports Buzz. I'm Giovanni Mio. And I'm Mark Spillane. It may be getting colder outside, but winter sports are starting to heat up. That's right, Mark. The men's ice hockey season is now in full swing, and tonight we have highlights of their weekend series against Ohio State. But we're not finished with fall sports just yet, Gio. We're also going to tell you about women's rugby as they look to follow up their record-breaking performance last weekend. From alumni field straight to the pitch, we're going to look at the soccer teams as the men hosted Mount St. Mary's while the women's squad hosts their final home game of the season versus Sacred Heart. All that and more, coming up. The TD Bank Sports Center screams excitement on the outside, but on the inside, well, it literally is loud. The annual Quinnipiac Pep Rally at the TD Bank Sports Center, known as Bobcats Madness, set a second straight attendance record with over 3,100 people. Sports Pulse was there to cover the event. Bobcats Madness highlighted around two main events. Boomer to Bobcats' 10th birthday and TD Bank Sports Arena allowing their 500,000th attendee. The evening started off with introductions of all Quinnipiac Spirit Groups and addresses from SGA President Ben Cloutier and School President John Leahy. Following the national anthem, played by the QU Pep Band, Senior Associate Athletic Director Billy Mecca did his yearly dance. All the Bobcats' fall, winter, and spring teams were introduced before performance from all QU Spirit Groups. Both basketball teams were introduced to the crowd and competed in several events, including the three-point and dunk contests. Followed by a grand finale of all spirit groups performing together, our coverage will be available in the upcoming days. The men's ice hockey team entered this past weekend the 20th ranked team in the nation after falling two spots from 18th place following their series split with Robert Morris last weekend. Mary Mack and Maine dropped out of the rankings completely as Northern Michigan and Colorado College each jumped Quinnipiac for 18th and 19th place respectively. But the Bobcats had a chance to regain momentum this weekend against the Buckeyes of Ohio State. Let's check out the highlights. Going to jump right into the second period. Matthew Pekka getting ready to take a faceoff. It's a 0-0 game still against the Buckeyes. Pekka's going to skate in. He's going to shoot and score. Snipe City population. Matthew Pekka. Bobcats take the 1-0 lead. Ohio State's going to get a breakaway chance coming the other way. It's going to be Travis Stackchuck put the backhander past Eric Hartzell, but it hits the post and goes wide. Hartzell with a little bit of help from the net. Midway through the period. This is the third now. Puck on the boards. Matt Johnson in the slot. Gets it to Lundy. Johnson shoots and scores. The Buckeyes knock the game at one. After the goal, Hartzell trying to regroup. He knows that he has to help his team here. Peck is going to win the faceoff. Dal Hughes off the post. It won't go. Bobcats remain tied at one. Still time, but it's winding down. QU has the puck in the offensive zone. Clay Harvey with a couple of shots. He can't get it in. Another shot's going to come around, and it won't go. Ohio State's going to hold on as time runs out. They're going to go to overtime. Quinnipiac bench getting ready for overtime. Coach Pecknold making sure his players are ready. They're going to have a chance right off the start. Travis St. Dennis going to skate in, take a snapshot real quick. Saved by Jelly. Jelly was great on the day. Stole this win from the Bobcats. That would be their last chance in overtime. But Chizura is going to have a chance for Ohio State. Saved by Hartzell. Ohio State and the Bobcats would tie. Hartzell had 24 saves on the day. And here's Coach Pecknold after the game. I would say the only thing we need to do is we need to finish. Like we're getting chances and we're not finishing. Uh, whether it's power play or five on five, we've had a, a ton of chances and we just, you know, we just need a little more confidence and bear down and get that puck out of the barn. I mean, there's always room, always room to improve. I think we're we're moving the puck well and we're getting we're getting chances. So that's always a good thing. If we weren't getting chances, then we would we kind of look ourselves in the mirror. But we just got we just got to get bear down and put the puck in the net. That's all. One was not enough for these teams to play though. Quinnipiac and OSU took the ice once more at the High Point Solutions Arena Saturday afternoon. Could the Bobcats win the second frame or retain their national ranking, or would the Buckeyes take a victory back to Columbus? To the rink we go. Now the Bobcats and Buckeyes first period, nothing going on goal-wise, but six and a half minutes into the second period, Coy Harvey passes to Jeremy Lang with a slap shot, bang, to the top shelf. Bobcats take a 1-0 lead off Harvey's team-leading third assist of the season. Now later on in the period, after a play ends, a fight ensues at Quinnipiac's bench between several players. Ohio State junior defender Curtis Gettig gets ejected from the game. And then QU would add on to their lead in the third period with Matthew Pekka. Oh, what can't he do? 
scores off a right to left side, moving the, the, the net away. Q takes a 2 0 lead. Pekka with the second goal of the season. Ohio State counters 11 minutes later when Sam Jardine at the blue line shoots the puck to flex off the skate of Max McCormick past Eric Hartzell for the goal. 2 1 Quinnipiac. But after a few minutes, the referees wanted to review the play as the puck might have went off the skate of McCormick. As both captains talk over with the referee, the referee gives the goal to Ohio State, so the goal stands. But it wasn't enough for Ohio State as Jeremy Langwood gets the open net goal with a little bit over a minute left to give Quinnipiac a 3-1 lead. Clay Harvey gets a sport assist to the season. Quinnipiac runs the clock out in their own zone and the Bobcats take away the second game of the series with a 3-1 victory. Here's head coach Rand Pecknold on the win. I thought our team played great tonight. I thought it uh, just was an excellent effort. We, we were you know, very coachable. We did little things well. We got pucks out. We got pucks in. We worked our forecheck. Kelly Kill was great again, and, and obviously Hartzell was uh, you know, a little bit of a role for us. So it was a nice, nice win, big win for us. I think it could have been better. Obviously, we'd have liked to sweep, and I think we deserved to win last night's game, but you, know, you can't win them all, and we, we responded today really well, so that's good. Uh, based on adversity there, uh, first night I felt like we uh, played well against them too. They got a late goal, and we still uh, ended up tying that one, and then today, they came back and we ended up getting a good short end goal by Pekka and finishing off there. So it's just good to see the team battle back like that. Now the men's ice hockey team upcoming schedule, they face Colgate in Hamilton, New York, as well as go to Amer American International and host American International Tuesday, November 6th, followed by Colgate Friday, that following Saturday against Cornell, Clarkson November 16th, and November 17th, they go to St. Lawrence. Now we are joined by Sports Plus analyst Nick Dench. Nick, thanks for stopping by. Anytime. Both Matthew Pekka and Jeremy Langlois scored this weekend. Which of these two players are more important to the Bobcats' success? It's got to be Matthew Pekka. He was an all-around player last year. Sophomores notoriously go through that sophomore slump. If he can overcome a sophomore slump, this team will be a much better team than they've showed so far this season. Well, besides struggling on the power play, Nick, what is the one thing Quinnipiac must improve upon? It goes right along with Matt Pekka. That first line has to step up. Last year it was one of the top lines in the ECAC. Now it's struggling. Pekka has two goals from this past weekend, but nobody else on that line has more than a point. Kellen Jones has uh, one assist, and the team's really been struggling. That line in particular has been struggling all season. Well, other than the phenomenal penalty kill we've been seeing so far, what has been the most impressive feature of the Bobcats' play this season? That second line. The second line with Langlois. Jordan, uh, Jordan Samuels Thomas and Travis St. Dennis the first two weekends was phenomenal. They scored both goals against Maine. They scored two of the goals against Robert Morris. That line has been physical. It's been an offensive presence. It's been a defensive presence. They've really done it all for this team so far. Now, Nick, junior forward Connor Jones did not play versus Ohio State this weekend due to an injury. How much does his absence hurt this team? That absence is huge. We always see Callan Jones and Connor Jones, the twins, they play together and they look very good together for the most part. When one of them is off the ice, a lot of time it looks like the other one is lost. And with Connor out for the, this past weekend and possibly the future, with him out we need to see how Kellen is going to adapt to that playing without his twin brother. Thank you, Nick. Great analysis as always. On the women's side, the Bobcats split a road series against Syracuse on Friday and Saturday. Quinnipiac opened the two-game set with a 3-2 overtime victory powered by an Arika Uden Johansson goal with just seven seconds to play in the extra period. However, the Bobcats could not sweep the series as they fell on Saturday 4-0. Kelly Babstock was held to just one goal on the weekend, but remains the nation's fourth leading scorer. She and her team will be back on the ice next Friday at home versus Harvard. Now it's time for us to catch our breath here on Sports Balls, but when we come back, we will have women's rugby and men's soccer highlights. We also have updates on field hockey and volleyball, plus a lot more expert analysis, so keep it here on Sports Balls. The women's rugby team has gone 8-0, including several 90-point beatdowns. After setting an NCAA record last week, defeating Hofstra University 130-0, Quinnipiac took to alumni field again to square off against Westchester. Did they stay undefeated? Let's check the highlights. Now after an early Quinnipiac try game, making it 5-0 Quinnipiac, a couple of quick passes from Westchester, resulting in Jackie Sacco scoring for the Golden Rams. Scores high at 5. That is the first time a point has scored on Quinnipiac's home turf, so it is pretty historic. Later on in the half, Quinnipiac comes right back, though, as the ball five gets to move the ball across the field beautifully. Shannon Durkin will score off a pass from Natalie Costco, and Quinnipiac will take an early 10-5 lead. 
And just like that, the Bobcats, well, they've been good all season. They've been doing this all year, adding to their lead. Natalie Costco once again getting the second try of the game after great team passing by the Bobcats. 15-5 Quinnipiac at half. Westchester trying to put some points on the board. Steals the ball away from Quinnipiac as Cheryl Johnson will go all the way for the try, putting Westchester within 3-15-12 Quinnipiac. But the Bobcats, they're undefeated for a reason. Putting the Westchester Golden Rams once again away. Natalie Costco getting her hat trick. Three tries in the overall game. Bobcats win it overall 32-12. Our very own Tom Albanese after the game. The Quinnipiac women's rugby team has defeated the Westchester Golden Rams by a final score of 32-12. Bobcats did not get their fourth consecutive shutout, but their defense did play very well throughout the entire game. Scoring for the Bobcats was led by Natalie Costco with three tries, Shannon Durkin with two tries, and Nora Kate O'Brien with one try. Kristen Rico was one for six on her conversions after each of the tries. Bobcats will next be traveling to take on Albany next Sunday at 1 p.m., followed by their final regular season game before the playoffs here on the Quinnipiac University rugby field on November 4th when they take on Rutgers. From live here at the Quinnipiac University rugby field, this is Thomas Albanese reporting for Sports Pause. The men's soccer team has not been nearly as dominant as their peers on the women's rugby squad, but they have played well enough to fight for an NEC playoff spot. They ended the weekend off of a 2-0 victory over Bryant last week and were looking to make another push towards the top four spot in the conference versus Mount St. Mary's today this, this afternoon. Let's see how they did. At 1 o'clock today, they are taking on Mount St. Mary's Mountaineers early in the second half. It's going to be Mount St. Mary's with a cross. Bobcats already up 1-0. They can't connect. Quinnipiac will retain the lead. Later on in the second half, Stevenson Hockey crosses the ball. Michael Baker with the header gets the goal. Bobcats go up by two. Quickly responding the other way, though. Mount St. Mary's trying to get on the board. Shot high over the crossbar. Won't go. Quinnipiac still out front by two. Then a goal kick opportunity for Mount St. Mary's. Simon Hind wins the header, but Phil Surprise gets the breakaway and buries it from top of the 18-yard box. Phil Surprise, phenomenal, as always, as he has been all year long. Bobcats now leading 3-0. Desperation time for the Mountaineers. Shot from midfield off the top of the crossbar and over. No goal. More bad luck for them. But the Bobcats looking to score again. Surprise to Hind. The ball is passed to Malky. Malky with the shot. Bobcats get the rebound. Goes in, but offsides. Goal won't count. Quinnipiac still leading by three. Mountaineers trying to recover. Paul Curlings is going to take the shot here. But a nice save made by Borja Angoita. He was great today, keeping the shutout alive for the Bobcats. Back up the field, Justin Ward with the breakaway for Quinnipiac. Unfortunately, he's unable to finish. Mount St. Mary's still alive, even though they trail by three. One last attempt for the Mountaineers. Zontra Dennis is going to take the shot here, and that's going to be Angoita again with his sixth save on the day. He locks down the shutout, and the Bobcats win 3 to nothing. With the victory over the Mountaineers, Quinnipiac moved into fourth place in the Northeast Conference. They currently hold the tiebreaker over St. Francis University with a better winning percentage. They must hold on to that fourth place spot over the next two weekends in order to advance to the NEC tournament. Now we're going to bring Nick Dench back in to talk a little bit more, this time about fall sports. With the recent win against Westchester, do you see this team finishing the season undefeated? Yeah, I do. This team playing Westchester, Westchester was second in the Tri-State Conference, and the, their opponents just get worse from here on out. This team scored o over 90 points three times this season. It's very difficult to beat, a, to beat this team. Three different Bobcats scored in Quinnipiac men's soccer's 3-0 shutout against Mount St. Mary's and are 4-1-1 in their past six games. Nick, what has been the secret to their recent success? The last two games have been shutouts, which is the first time since 2010 that the Bobcats have had back-to-back -back shutouts. That's impressive in its own. The defense has been, all, has been all over the place blocking shots. Borja and Goita finally getting hot. The team spreading the goals out. Justin Ward with his first career goal against Bryant. Marshall Baker and uh, Marshall Baker scoring his first career goal today. So you can't get much better than that. The team finally figuring out how to distribute the ball to players other than Phil Surprise, Robbie McClarney, and Will Daniels. Well, women's rugby only has two more games before the, stri the Tri State Conference tournament. Is it possible that this team can not only win the conference championship, but the national championship as well? 
If the team continues to play this way, scoring all the points, they've only allowed 24 points this season. So if they continue to play the way they have been, I don't see how they can't compete for the national championship. Now the men's soccer team goes on the road this weekend in the face of Robert Morris and St. Francis. They currently sit fourth in the Northeast Conference. Can this team potentially take a top three conference seed? Yes, if they continue to win, if they win, this, win out this weekend and get the six points that they desperately need, they'll get separation from St. Francis, Pennsylvania, and Robert Morris on the bottom of the conference, so they should win that game. That'll get them another six points, put them in contention with that third team, and then they have to play Fairleigh Dickinson, who's number one in the conference, next, uh, the following weekend. So three huge games coming up in these next two weeks. Thanks, Nick. The women's soccer team is set to play its final home game of the season on Friday. The Bobcats were ready to, to fight for a top five seed in the Northeast Conference against rival Sacred Heart. But the rain said otherwise, and the game was postponed due to inclement weather. It will be made up at the QU Soccer Field on October 23rd at 2 p.m. Dave Clark's squad last placed in the top five in 2010 when they finished third in NEC play. They would lose to St. Francis University in the semifinals in a shootout. The Quinnipiac field hockey team took the field twice this weekend. Four different Bobcats scored on Friday versus Robert Morris to earn the victory, but they were back at it again this afternoon, taking on St. Francis University. A Celine Adam Schick goal late in the second half buried Quinnipiac. The lethal scoring duo of Jess Rusin and Jenelise Taylor was held scoreless in both games, and the weekend split brings their record to 10-6 and six as they remain second in the Northeast Conference. Women's volleyball continues to struggle. Their losing streak reached 12 today, dropping three sets to none against LLU Brooklyn. While it has not been a great year for the Bobcats, history was made in their recent loss. Junior Logan Riker surpassed Kelby Carey as Quinnipiac's all-time leader in digs with 1,035. Since their lone win against Providence in mid-September, the team has failed to win two sets in a single match. There was even a stretch where QU went 22 sets without winning one. Quinnipiac will try to once more end their losing skid this weekend as they travel to Pennsylvania to square off against Robert Morris and St. Francis. When we come back, we will bring back our analysts at the roundtable to discuss who has been the best athlete for the fall season. Will there be a surprise involved, or do our Quinnipiac sports experts say otherwise? Also, members of the men's ice hockey team shaved their heads for a good cause. All that and more when we return on Sports Falls. We now bring in our analyst Nick Dench to discuss who has been the best fall athlete this season. First off, Nick, thank you for joining us. Of course. Now, who do you think has been the best fall athlete this season and why? Nicole Lewis by far, seventh in the nation in save percentage, 20th in the nation in goals against. She has a 798 save percentage, which is absurdly good in field hockey. A 164 goals against, which is amazing. She's had over seven saves in more than half of their games this season. You take her out of net, no disrespect to Conaboy, but they do not have the record they have right now. They do not have the season they have right now. Nicole Lewis has been the backbone for this team for the past two years. You take her out, they are not where they are right now. Mark? I'm going to stick with the goalie, but I'm going to go with a different team. How about Jill Kelly, guys? We had her on the show earlier this year. She's a great personality, a really nice person, an even better player. She was phenomenal this year and continues to be for the Bobcats. She's first in the entire conference in the NEC in goals against average. She's second best in the NEC and save percentage, and she's tied for leading shutouts. Without her, that team has no chance of making the playoffs. They're right there on the cusp. If they can just get over that hump, I think it's got to be her. i got to disagree with both of you guys. I'm going to go with a soccer team, but I'm going to go with the men's. I will say Phil Surprise. Seven of the team's 21 goals a season, team captain, leads the team with 15 points, and they're 4-1-1 one overall in conference play. Now, early on in the season, we know Surprise carried the team. Him and Will Dance were the only two goal scorers. But he's been able to help this team as well as players like Ogan Jopi and Tim Quigley, even Simon Hine, try to get a, a few goals. So the leadership on the pitch, and you always see surprise, even when the team's losing, by a wide margin, he'll be running down the field 110%. I think that motivation and that stride carries on to the younger players. I think with Phil Surprise, the thing is, he went through that stretch. This was, today's goal was the first goal he scored in six or seven games. The team really needed somebody else to pick it up. He, he's a very good player but he didn't cover the team the way he should have as the offensive leader on that team. And he's been shooting everything over the net. Today was the first one that he had under the crossbar in two or three games. It's, he needs to stay more consistent if he wants to be the best fall athlete. Along with that, he's also not a goalie, and goalies that are the too. only players on the <laughs> field who play every minute of every game. As a forward, he's not always out there, so you can't always rely on him. You can always rely on the goalies. Well, 
and it surprises defense, you don't always have to score to be a leader on the field. The smaller things, leading your team down the pitch, as well as setting up free kicks, it's not always about the goal. It's not always about scoring the goals. It's more about the leadership. And I think surprise, out of all the three players we mentioned, brings the most leadership to this team. I 100% disagree. Nicole Lewis is head and shoulders better than everybody else with leadership. Jill Kelly's quiet sometimes. She also has a very good backup in Grodzki who has two, two shutouts of her own. So Nicole Lewis, very vocal. You can hear her through that mask across the field. She's always the first person to go tell, the, go tell a player what they did wrong, congratulate when them when they scored a goal. She is always that player that is backing someone up. She hits the crossbar every time with her stick if she gives up a goal. She's so emotional on that team. She really personifies the personality of that team. Megan Conaboy is just as good of a backup as any backup goalie at any team at this school. So I don't think you can really make that argument. Unless you guys have anything else, I think we're going to have to di agree just to disagree on this one. We have to. I just feel like none of us are going to agree at any point who is the best fall athlete. Well, we all know that the correct answer is Joe Kelly because that it's was not, my answer. No, not even close. <laughs> anyway, the men's ice hockey team was involved with St. Baldrick's Foundation last weekend after their game against Robert Morris. Our own Taylor Massey has the story. Life is too precious. Do not destroy it. And life is life. Fight for it. Thank you guys so much for having me. Four years ago, the Bobcats hosted an event called St. Baldrick's, where they raised money and shaved their heads in support of a cure for childhood cancer. This year, they decided it was time for round two. Uh, you know, it's, it's always good to, you know, give back to a good cause, and, you know, it's, it's great the second time, especially raising so much money, I guess. In our, my two years of doing it, we've raised over $55,000, which is amazing, to, to St. Baldrick's. The St. Baldrick's Foundation is committed to funding research towards a cure for cancer. For some, this cause hits close to home. Well, cancer has been a big part of my life ever since my mom passed away from it in 2007. And, uh, you know, I just, anything I can do to help the cause out to, you know, one day eliminate this awful disease is anything I can do is uh, what I'll do. Mike was lucky enough to have the support of his team, and together, they raised more than 20000 for the cause. Guys went out and started fundraising and, you know, you know, it was a little friendly competition on the team who could raise more money and, you know, it kind of helped and, you know, we, we raised a lot of money this year. There is absolutely, there's some, there's some bonding to the whole experience and, uh, you know, as we all make fun of each other for the next couple of weeks waiting for the, for the hair to grow back, but there's certainly some bonding involved. The hair is gone for now, but the impression left will remain forever. Oh, definitely. I'll definitely do it again if I, if I have the opportunity. The cause might mean more to some than others, but together they all have one thing in common. They've been brought closer as a team. Taylor Massey, Q30 Sports. Well, Mark, that's going to do it for this week, and what a hectic week it was. Hectic indeed, Gio, but nothing is too difficult for us here at Q30 or Sports Pause. Speaking of Q30, if you want to get involved at the station or our show, go to our website at www.q30.org. And don't forget to follow Sports Pause on Twitter at Q30 Sports. For our analyst Nick Dench, our producers, and everybody behind the scenes, I'm Mark Spillane. And I'm Giovanni Mio. Good night, everyone.